Now, John Mahama's running mate in the 2020 elections, Professor Nana Jane Opoku Ajiman, has been addressing a forum on corruption today. It was organized by the Center for Ethical Governance and Administration, uh, SIGA. Uh, now, she believes corruption has become endemic in a country with a struggling citizenry. Here are excerpts of her speech. As you can see, an administration, but that's not a reason why it should continue to be so. For a country such as ours, that continues to struggle to meet basic needs, corruption is the most undesirable specter because it, it just whittles away whatever we are able to generate. It is an insidious stumbling block to the well-being of all of us, especially to the vulnerable. At various stages in our history, there have been epoch-making events through which we sought to, to tackle the canker of corruption or to deter people from indulging in it. Despite these efforts, ladies and gentlemen, it is perhaps fair to say that on the evidence of what we see today, not many gains have been made in the fight to free ourselves from the shackles of corruption. Fifi has given many examples that we all know of. It, it, it looms so large and it threatens to damage everything that we think we have achieved. And this is why this topic is so important. And it is not about, it shouldn't be a subject for politicians who are seeking power to wax lyrical and sermonize about it. It is an intractable albatross around the collective neck, and we must remove it. Corruption has become so pervasive that it threatens everything that we plan to achieve. The grand governmental level corruption is not so difficult to point to because it becomes so obvious. Several factors account for this, not least among them a political and governance system that appears built to thrive on corruption. And I'm glad about the references you made in law about proving and so on. It's as if it is something that we are just guarding jealously, let it will break. This is something we must get rid of. And if it is a law that must be changed to change the perception of even the people we train, then so be it. So this is something that perhaps uh, must inform the review of courses in some of our institutions. We know that it has not been all gloomy in the fight. Uh, throughout our history, there have been moments when we seem to have hit the right chord with the right leadership, possessing the right attitude and approach to overcome corruption or minimize it. But then there have been times when we have completely relapsed into a more serious return of the problem. The present situation counts among the worst we have seen and the worst we have been on this whole journey of getting rid of corruption. And I think, was it Samson or so, who used the example of somebody who had a certain amount and after two years, had how many times over? This is enough evidence. What else does anybody need? And what has happened? When that doesn't happen, what message do we send to others? Because the flower rhetoric that have made many to believe that the public purse was going to be beyond the reach of those who coveted it for illicit personal gain is not really true. At least that was the commitment that was made to the people of Ghana. No sooner had those promises been made to get into power than it became clear that there was a transparent mismatch between the rhetoric and actual deeds. Instead of protecting the public purse and ensuring the utilization of same for the greater public good, it, this purse has been subjected to unacceptable abuse. So all these things, issues of corruption, have come in thick and fast, depriving us of the, of the minimum things that we even need to, to work with. It is one thing that government officials engage in corruption and get away with it because of weak accountability systems. And it becomes rather unsettling when the personal examples of the leaders at the highest levels 
offer little words emulating, offer little words by way of, um, of reducing or encouraging all of us to come down the ladder of corruption. This should not be the case of rusting gold blaming iron for same. If at the highest levels of leadership, nepotism is seen or deemed to be acceptable, the misuse of the very scarce public resources become routine. How do those serving at the pleasure of leadership feel deterred from taking part in the scramble for what should have been our national resources? To fight corruption effectively, leaders must lead by example. Leaders must be able to crack the whip when necessary. Being difficult cannot be an excuse. The situation is made much worse when those abusing the public purse do not find it enough to help themselves to the fruits of our collective sweat, but also find it necessary to weaken those state institutions that could have offered the semblance, even of that, of a shield against their excesses. We have only recently borne witness to, to the removal of an uh, for, of an aud auditor general who gained acclaim for his vigilant efforts to hold public officials accountable for their mishandling of government funds because he took the fight too close to the doorstep of power. What example does this set? We have also seen a special prosecutor resign after what he says was an effort to obstruct his work in order to protect That was um, the vice presidential candidate in the 2020 elections uh, for the NDC, Professor Nana Jane Opokwajima. Now, also at this event was private legal practitioner Samson Ladi Anyenini, who condemned what he believes to be the inaction on the part of the state in dealing with corruption. And we know the, court, the cases, so to speak. Corruption is such a serious issue in Ghana. It has dominated perception, surveys, and public advocacy, especially by anti-corruption civil society organizations. We know of the civil society organizations such as Ghana's version of the Transparency International, the GII, Ghana Integrity Initiative, the CDD, and its Afrobarometer survey that it does, the Ghana Anti-Corruption Coalition, and several individuals. We are also aware of Transparency International's work that affects and reflects our country. We are clearly familiar with the Auditor General's annual report, the constitution mandates to be submitted to the Public Accounts Committee. And every year, we read, plainly speaking, the deliberate theft of the state purse that is riddled in the Auditor General's report. Very unfortunately, through the fight by Occupy Ghana, the Supreme Court empowered the Auditor General to be able to surcharge and disallow when these misfeasance happen. The one Auditor General who was lucky to come into office at a time when this legal victory was won, and who started to implement it fiercely has been sacrificed. The current Auditor General, unfortunately, is disinterested in the power, the awesome power of surcharge and disallowance that has been handed him by law and by the confirmation of the Supreme Court. 
The reason I decide to emphasize that at the start is that we need to look for the solutions. Because it would appear that even the constitutional and statutorily enshrined solutions are failing us. Samson Ladi Anyenuni speaking there. He, of course, is the host of News File here on the Joy News channel. He's also um, the 2020 um, Journalist of the Year.